I'm continuing my series of mass rush reviews with Season 2, Episode 3, Radar's Report. So this is basically another one of those, a character is writing to somebody and we're seeing where the writing part, which is the story that unfolds. So we've had, you know, people writing to family and all that, but this time, it's, well, the weekly report that Radar's filling out for Henry, and then Henry has to sign. And actually, that's one of the gags in the episode. At the very end, Henry is going, is finally able to sign the report because, you know, the report is done and he says, let me actually read this one because you never let me read anything you give me to sign. And that is a very common thing we see in MASH, or at least in seasons 1, 2, and 3, where Henry just signs whatever is put in front of him. So, we get that some stuff. There's some nice scenes with radar, no typing, where the one scene he moves his notes on top of the typewriter, so he then uses the adding machine, I guess it is. Just like, come on, like, okay, okay. Just a fun little gag there. But let's actually talk about what's going on. So, unlike some of the other ones where a character is writing about the ongoings and it's a series of small but disconnected vignettes, these really are connected. Well, actually, two of them are connected. The third one isn't. So you have this, you know, basically go on the OR with a Chinese patient who is, you know, rightfully scaled out of his mind and reacting accordingly. Does accidentally contaminate another patient and injures a nurse. But you can understand why he was acting, you know, scaled. Because, yeah, you wake up in a room of people you don't recognize. And especially, you know, if you the only time you've ever seen Americans were propaganda posters. Yeah, you're probably going to freak out. Probably lots of Americans who would have woken up on the, uh, in the operating room in Asia, especially after propaganda. Yeah, they probably react that same way too. Quite understandable. And then, of course, Hawke is flirting with the nurse and, man, he's really smitten for this nurse because apparently he's even talked about the potential of marriage. Weirdly, he does get take a pause when he sees that she has a ring on. That's never stopped Hawke before. But maybe it's because... He was so smitten, he actually was actually truly caring about what she wanted. Even though he talked about it before checking if that's what she actually wanted. There's a lot of different ways you can look at that, but one way is they're slowly starting to try to make him seem less of a womanizer, but still haven't quite gotten there yet. That's one way of looking at that scene. Another way is, you know, the writers just thought that was going to be a fun bit. And it was a fun bit, so it can go either way, but I kind of like the idea that they're slowly trying to flesh out Hawkeye's character and not being so much of a womanizer, though still a bit. Trap was patient that was contaminated because of the, the Chinese soldier who contaminated by destroying the, the, the last part of, of blood, or that blood type. Ha the patient doesn't make it, so Trap considers revenge. Hawkeye talks him out of it. But the part of the episode I really want to talk about is the clinical part of the episode, in which Sidney Freeman makes his first appearance, he's brought in to evaluate Klingo to see if he can qualify for a Section 8. Now, I do want to just one thing. Matches continuity is always all over the place, and that includes Sidney's name. Apparently, in this episode, they credited his character as Milton Friedman, but they go over Sidney later on. Match continuity for you. But what's going on is he evaluates Klingo and tells him that if he signs a document where he admits to being a transvestite and a homosexual, he will get his Section 8. But Klingo refuses. Why would Klingo, someone who is so set on getting out of the army, refuse it being given to him on a silver plateau? Well, it's not a silver plateau. Well, it might be silver plated, but it's lead. The reason is, is we gotta look at the history of the times. So MASH is set in the 1950s. And it was filmed and created in the 1970s. Remember how I said he wasn't just given a document to say that he was crazy, but that he admits to being a transvestite and a homosexual. Nowadays, depending on where you are in the United States, and truly depending, it's not generally a big deal. A guy wearing women's clothes? Not a too big deal. Women wearing guys' clothes? Even less of a big deal. Really, for men, it's more of only performances. While with women, they can just you know, throw on a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and no problem. But back in the 50s, and even the 70s, wearing the clothes of the opposite gender, especially for guys, was a huge, huge social faux pas. It could literally destroy lives. Same thing back then being labeled as homosexual, as gay. 
could totally destroy your life. A good historical example, Alan Turing. He was very important with computing and also with breaking the dynamic code that the Germans used during World War II. And when it came out that he was gay, his life was utterly destroyed. And Klingel, they portrayed him straight. And both straight in the comedy sense, where the only thing comedic about him in, is his dresses and wearing women's clothing. But other than that, he plays it straight. He's just a guy wearing dresses. That's how Jamie Farr played Klingo. They played him straight. And that also, because he's not putting on a gay, girly accent or anything like that, that's also portraying the character as straight. So, I think it's safe to say that Klingo is straight. Especially considering that he does get married twice in the series by the end. The, the reason why I want to bring that up is... If Klingo is straight, as the, as the text suggests, strongly suggests, mind you, and he's only wearing dresses as a bit to get out of the army, admitting to being homosexual would totally destroy his life. It wouldn't be him coming out of the closet, it would be destroying his life. And even if he was gay back then, you didn't admit it because it could destroy your life because of the way society was at the time, it's so unaccepting of people living those lives and being there. That's how these things were in the 1950s and still in the 1970s. That is just some very important context for why Klingo doesn't sign and leaves. Now, if it was just admitting that you're crazy, yeah, Klingo would have signed. And by signing and admitting he's crazy means he wasn't crazy and he probably wouldn't have gotten into Section 8 anyhow. Now, MASH covers some of these topics better on in later episodes, but this is really probably the first time where it's seriously brought up. Now, they don't mention why Klingo objected, and that's probably because MASH was a product of the times. Everyone watching it in the 70s would have known what that meant. But if you're watching it today, and you're from a fairly liberal area, you may not realize what the implications of Klingo saying that he was that stuff back in the 50s actually meant. But that is it's actually some interesting social commentary that they didn't quite fully address, but just hinting at the most serious topics that MASH would later talk about. But those are just my thoughts. Yes, I'm leaving on that note. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. Thank you for watching my video. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to give this video a like and share. Also, consider subscribing to my channel to stay up to date on all my latest content. In the meantime, thank you for watching, and as always, have a good day, a good night, wherever you are. May the Force be with you, always.